Okay, hi. Uh, today we're going to talk about nominalism. I'm going to give this a shot. I'm on a little uh, laptop here, uh, but uh, we'll, well, I'm just going to do this and see uh, see what happens. Come up with my little nominalism PowerPoint there. And, uh, that up on the, on the screen. Okay, Go back. Nominalism. So nominalism is a term that comes up in certain metaphysical discussions. And my job today is to um, try and explain it to you. Just again, a really basic introduction. I'm not assuming that you know really very much, although I am assuming that you're, you know, basically someone who wants to know about philosophy and um, and wants to hear some names and sources and things. Okay, so a basic explanation of the metaphysical term nominalism, starting off with, of course, ancient uh, ancient philosophy, metaphysics. So what's metaphysics? Um, what are some examples of metaphysics? If I say, well, I think that the physical universe exists, but I think that God exists also. And I don't think that God is the same thing as the rest of the physical universe. So that we can call that dualist. What does dualist mean? It means I think that there are two kinds of things that exist. I think there's the, the physical universe and then there's God. And of course, another thing that we'll talk about today is the thinking that, well, the body exists, but then the mind exists. That's something that's different from the body. And that's another example of a metaphysically dualist position. Um, okay, so um, the second bullet point, a person's commitments to categories of being is that person's ontology. So if, so if you believe in God, you believe God's something different from the world, then in your, in your ontology of God and the world. If like Descartes or someone who thinks that the mind is different from the body, and there's also God that exists, then you have three things in your ontology mind, matter, and God. You can still call that a dualist position. Monist positions are positions where someone, your ontology only has one thing. And typically, uh, as I said in the last sentence on the slide there, the most common monist metaphysics is materialism. So materialism, you know, just roughly speaking, the view that only matter exists. Uh, physicalism, naturalism, the point here really is monism more than a dualism. Maybe we can put an adjective on the monism, but monism is what we're going for here, really. Uh, monism of the, what we'll just call the material world. Uh, okay. And, but again, you can have other kinds of monism. Spinoza thought that only, you know, the physical, the only God existed, that's a kind of monism. Berkeley says only mind existed, that's a monism. All right, you see the point. Now, nominalism is a strategy of materialist monism. So sometimes with philosophy, it's hard to understand why people are saying some of the things that they're saying. And it's a good, it's a good thing to know something about sort of their program or what they're up to. And sometimes it's hard to know. Uh, Nominalists are typically people who resist the idea that there are non-physical things that exist. Nominalists are people who want to say that the universe is constructed out of physical objects and physical properties and processes. And there really aren't any non-physical things. In the classic spirit of empiricism, right? Empiricism, the view that a lot of metaphysical speculation is a product of not paying attention to Marx's experience. So we have evidence to believe. Uh, so, all right. Um, the relevant point is the sort of monism is meant to provide a non-dualistic accounts of various properties. That's what nominalism is trying to do. They're notably physical properties. Okay, we don't want them to be platonic properties that are floating around and then get involved with matter. We, uh, but also the property of meaning we'll talk about and uh, the property of contingent, being contingent thing. Uh, so on the Platonist view, you know, and it's a compelling view, an interesting one. You know, things are always coming to be and passing away. That is, matter is constantly coming to participate in some kind of intelligible form, some kind of category, and then losing it and passing away. And this kind of endless tidal flux of becoming, that's life in the material world. For human beings as well, and that's the human condition, one of the things that makes Plato a great humanist writer on that. Um, properties interact, second bullet point here, mysteriously with matter forming the material world into intelligible categories. Um, nominalism, the last bullet point, is typically a strategy to provide a materialist alternative to that. So the, what's, you know, what does this mean? So the Platonist says there's sort of the form of blue, and then the form of blue is causing the matter to sort of congeal and become uh, into, the, into the category of blue things and then pass away again. Uh, 
And so the thing that's the eternal thing, the thing that's really the causal thing is the property of blueness in itself and not any particular blue thing. Uh, that's the platonic view. And the nominalist is saying, no, uh, you don't have warrant for saying there's anything other than all the blue things. The only thing, the only thing you really, on a, on a metaphysical level, the only thing you're really entitled to say is that there is this category of blue things. It's basically the idea. Uh, nominalism explains. So no man, Latin the name, nombre, espanol. Nominalism, the view that words are, uh, words for properties like blue or circular or harmonic are just names of sets of material things, the blue things, the circular things, the harmonic things. Um, and again, the strategy is to maintain some kind of monist materialism, say all there are are these physical things, these sets of physical things. And so what you're calling harmoniousness is the set of all these uh, instances of harmonic things. For example, on a platonic view, the set of circular objects is composed of individual material things of various sorts. I remember stone circles, metal circles, chrome circles, participating in the transcendental form of circularity, which according to Plato is mind and matter independent in, a, in an empty universe, one with no matter and energy in it, all the mathematical entailments and, and mathematical objects would still exist, he would say. That's what, how he would put it. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's instantiated in matter. But the nominalist then, just again, we're trying to understand what nominalism means. Nominalist says, no, uh, those, those so-called platonic objects, those transcendental forms, those aren't real. Those are just names of these properties. And so, you know, there is just all, there are just all of the circular particular objects. And when we say there is such a thing as circularity, we're just referring to those things, those things in our world. Last bullet point, circular objects exist, says the nominalist. And that's the only thing you can, that's the only claim you can make. See how it's, it's related to empiricism that way. Extrapolating another category of being is metaphysically promiscuous, unwarrant, unwarranted. The nominalist says, I can do that work. I can talk about properties, for example, and other kinds of universals. And I can do it uh, only referring to concrete particulars. That's the idea. Uh, this is an argument that goes all the way back to ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, and it was an, uh, uh, an objection that Aristotle had. You know, Aristotle doesn't like this transcendental dualism of Plato's. Aristotle's more scientifically minded. Uh, he doesn't like it that Plato says there are things that are non-physical things, things that are non-sensible things, things that can't be seen. Aristotle objected to Plato's dualism along recognizably in Pierce's science, that you couldn't really look at these things. Second bullet point. So, but Aristotle also doesn't want to be a reductive materialist, and he knows about reductive materialism. It's not like these ancient thinkers are naive about these things. Uh, he's got Democritus, who's one of the leading thinkers of the day, who claims that what the universe is really made out of are these atoms, the atom, the thing that can't be divided down any further, and these atoms swirling in the void to form worlds. Uh, this is this early atomism. I mean, that's where this word atomism comes from. And reductive materialism, the idea that all the stuff that we're looking up at up at a higher level of organization, all sort of mid-range physical objects and everything else, can be explained at some lower level in terms of general rules about the interactions of these atoms. And Aristotle was against that just as much as Plato was. Um, but Aristotle didn't want to be a metaphysical dualist like Plato. So, so Aristotle's trying to find a middle way, like many classical thinkers. So, um, so in Aristotle's view, third bullet point, the form of horse is the form of horse sort of pers pers uh, persists, like a sort of people say it's like a cookie cutter, like a, a pattern that's cutting out the cookie dough. So I've got the existing set of horses. You know, those are all the horses that exist. Notice that that's the same set as 200 years ago. Uh, assuming there's no 200 year old horses, doesn't have any of the same horses in it as uh, 200 years ago. 
And so basically, Aristotle tries to tame this platonic dualism by saying, look, you only find form in matter. And the third bullet point there, you know, a reasonable response to that, just to give a little taste of some technical argument there, is, you know, the Platonists can say, well, it's at least physically possible that there is not a 13 billion seven sided figure that exists concretely in this universe right now at this moment. Nonetheless, it does seem, uh, considering the unity of mathematics, that a 13 billion seven sided figure is, an, is a genuine mathematical object. So again, that's uh, uh, the, the anomalous side between Plato and Aristotle. I'm talking about that's just a little bit more. You know, Plato presents his form matter ontology as explanatory. He's going to tell us how come concrete particulars seem to be bundles of properties and the universe seems to be made out of properties. And he's going to do it with this ontology of form and matter, this dualistic ontology. Um, but Aristotle wasn't really sure that explained anything. You know, you know Aristotle understood that if you're going to talk about physical objects, you've got to talk about physical causation, physical causal relations between physical things. And he wouldn't have this interaction problem. You know, according to Plato, there are mind and matter independent transcendental form. There is a thing. There's a form, right, that is forming the universe. Um, and it's not physical. But then, you know, if, if I have a, a discipline of physical explanation, I'm going to explain uh, properties and processes and in, in particulars in physical terms. On the other hand, you know, I mean, everything comes at a price. I mean, if you don't want dualism and think that nominalism will get it for you, you have to ask whether that, how explanatory that is. I mean, according to nominalism, when we say that things are similar, we don't mean they share a property. Saying that they're similar is what we're saying. And so you have to say the yellow things uh, share some unanalyzable similarity in the first place. Because why? Why? Because remember, you're not allowed now to say, well, they all share the property of yellow. Because we have that's what we're asking, right? We're asking, what is a property after all? Um, so now take a mathematical property like circular, and saying that the circular objects all share some unanalyzable similarity is way more counterintuitive than the color example. Because it looks like, you know, we can have a Euclidean uh, formalization, a, a line every point on which is equidistant from a given point, right? We can, we can do that. So uh, you really get those platonic intuitions, I do anyway, thinking about the metaphysics of mathematics. You know, the, the novelist is pushing against those platonic intuitions and saying that all of these generalizations and universals are really just names of these sets of things that we encounter in our experience. Experience, talking, uh, speaking of empiricism, uh, the view that all knowledge is produced by experience. An exam that's an epistemological thesis. All knowledge is produced by experience. That's talking about what knowledge is, what certainty is, and so on. Whereas um, nominalism is definitely a metaphysical or ontological thesis. It says that uh, the world is made out of these sets of concrete particulars. But nominalists, and as, as I say there on the first bullet point, nominalist metaphysics and empiricist epistemology are very tightly intertwined. I think part of sort of the growing up of empiricism in the 20th century was, was realizing how much the metaphysics is still alive and well. So second bullet point, very, very basic construction here. Two kinds of inference, basically deductive, uh, the kind of inference that the rationalist sees as basic, an innatist would see as basic. So you have some sort of generalization, and based on this generalization, you can infer, you can produce information about a particular case, like Sherlock Holmes does. Whereas somebody like David Hume is going to say that you can, it's mostly all inductive inference, like a behaviorist, I'm going to say that uh, you are habituated to have expectations about the future based on regularities of your past experience. So everything, that's the inductive model of science, right? You're going to make repeated observations under controlled conditions and generate generalizations from the particulars. And that's essentially sort of the, the ideology of empiricism. It was, uh, as the last bullet point on the slide now, uh, meant to replace, I say they're the ghostly interventions of God. 
you know, uh, Descartes and Kant um, saying that somehow there were things kind of built in. And to the, you know, Kant showed that that's not an unreasonable thing to talk about. But from this uh, empiricist, revolutionary empiricist point of view from the 1700s, that looked like part of the old sort of uh, superstition, some superstitious metaphysics they wanted to get rid of. All right, so here's the basic idea again. Uh, Descartes, the mathematician, the great mathematician, saying you know something when you've shown that it's logically necessary, that it's true. Uh, deductive reasoning, you've got a hypothesis and you can uh, produce knowledge about the individual top down. And the modern revolution, sort of the modernist revolution, is this bottom up uh, inductive reasoning. You have empiric, you have experiences, and your experiences are the basis of your general uh, your general understandings. Okay. Um, now Hume, see, uh, Berkeley rather, Berkeley seems strange because Berkeley is the one you hear about. He says, "Well, everything's mental. Everything in the world is just uh, mental stuff." And that seems like an awfully odd thing to say. But look, if the problem is uh, we're worried about, about skepticism, skepticism about the external world, say, and we're worried about whether or not our mental representation is inaccurate, something has some kind of real relationship with the external world, the real world, uh, a quite reasonable and systematic empiricist response, if the empiricist says, the knowledge is based on experience is to say, look, the only thing we're really talking about are these experiences. If you're worried about whether they have some relationship with some other kind of stuff, this thing you're calling the external world, well, that's the thing we don't really know about. Um, the Berkeleyan model, which Hume explicitly does say that he thinks is right, essentially, is that uh, what you're calling the, the external world is just the set of all of your experiences. In other words, it's a nominalist picture of the external world. And if you say, well, there's some other external world, well, that's not going to be the subject of anybody's experiences. It's not like you're going to be able to somehow experience that other world. Um, this approach produces a persuasive response to skepticism. One cannot coherently posit an external anything if external is meant to signify something beyond experience. That doesn't, you know, interestingly, I don't think that makes Berkeley and Hume skeptics, right? Uh, they're, they're not the ones, the, the skeptic is the one who says that you can't prove that something called the external world exists. The Hume very cheerfully points out, well, I don't even know what you mean when you say external world. So I'm not the one who's got a problem with that. All right. So, so that basic nominalism is in behaviorism and the behaviorist model of psychology as, uh, again, coming straight from the source, you have regularities of experiences and these condition you to have expectations uh, for the future. These regularities are gonna be carried over in the future. It's conditioning, uh, classical conditioning. Um, of course, Kant come, again, Kant comes along and challenges that in interesting ways. Second bullet point, William James, Notice also is in the same empiric spirit when he says, look, correspondence, although correspondence theory of truth, it's true because the world is like my proposition is a true proposition because the world is like that. Correspondence theory of truth, common sense, uh, sounds good. But notice how Cartesian it is. That is, uh, my experience is like a photograph or something like that of something else. Uh, because it's a representation. It's like a picture. And these operationalist approaches of behaviorism, people like Hume on learning, people like uh, William James on belief fixation, eliminate mental representation. And, and in doing so, they also eliminate this problem about skepticism. And they are novelist approaches. Last bullet Philosophical behaviorism, philosophical behaviorism, behaviorism understood as philosophy of mind and not just a method in experimental psychology, has a nominalist account of personhood and personality. And I do think that all of these empiricists, I mean, again, including Wittgenstein, are uh, philosophical behaviorists in the sense. I think that's what's interesting about them, good about them. The person is just all of the physical process and actions of the living body. In nominalist terms, person denotes the set of all physical actions. And it's just as the world uh, is denotes the set of all the experiences. 
uh, carrying on with this tradition is Ludwig Wittgenstein in the 20th century, whose basic vision is, in both terms of mind and language, that these are things that exist, the property of meaning, for example, exists only outside of bodies, not inside of bodies. No language inside the body. Uh, and um, so challenging also that connection between language and thought in an interesting way. Uh, on a platonic view, propositions, really any uh, linguistic or symbolic object, right? Uh, we're talking about meaning, are transcendental entities, the non-physical property of meaning or reference. That's what's interesting, metaphysically interesting about them. This meaning is like a picture of the world contained in this symbol prior to use. And so you're using the word correctly if you're getting the meaning right. Third bullet point. Wittgenstein eliminates this traditional property of meaning. Again, notice you've got to do it both in philosophy of mind, but also philosophy of language, metaphysics of language. You're going to have to show that that property of meaning is something that can be eliminated. And he does it by developing a functional role, what's called functional role semantics, very different notion of semantics altogether. Semantics not being a matter of some sort of reference. So look at his meaning of use. What is it that's being done by using that symbol, uh, whatever kind of symbol it is, and whatever kind of physical form the symbol takes in that moment? And the meaning is going to be the accumulation of all of the uses that it's put to, which is, after all, what lexicographers do with language. It's very persuasive when you start to, you know, just sort of ask yourself what language is really like and its sort of amorphousness and its conventionality. Last bullet point, the traditional semantic properties of propositions, meaning, truth, value, and logical relations. These are things that propositions are needed to have if you have a representationalist theory of mind, because, uh, you know, physical things don't have the properties of meaning, being true or false, and bearing logical relations to other things. But propositions do. But those are non-physical entities. The nominalist doesn't want that. What the nominalist has is all of these instances of using the physical tokens. Those are physical things. So all of the sets of instances of people using the physical token to get something done. You know, and, and so what you're calling the meaning is sort of the, the aggregation of that. So now you don't need things like the non-physical property of meaning or the non-physical entity, the proposition that has to exist to have the non-physical property of meaning. You've just shown that everything can be done uh, with only reference to physical events like those simple uses. Finally, so we've done, so we said, okay, properties, you know, nominalism says properties are really just names of sets. Meaning, nominalism says uh, that meaning is really just the name of the set of all the uses the symbols been put to. <clears throat> In terms of skepticism, nominalism says that when you're calling the external world, it's just a set of all the experiences that you've had. <clears throat> now let's talk about modality just quickly. Um, some things are necessary. We consider, say, some things existence to be necessary, or we consider a proposition to be necessarily true. Uh, when we're talking about states of affairs, that's de re, and de dicto is the Latin phrase we say we're talking about whether or not a proposition is necessarily true or only contingently true. And then there is whether something is possible, whether it is impossible. And then we talk about probability. All of these things are difficult to, uh, they're problems for empiricism. They're all difficult to sort of observe on an object. Is it a necessary or is it, is it contingent, say? Second bullet point, historically formal logic struggled to represent these modes. Uh, the basic empiricist problem is nothing observable need distinguish the necessary from the contingent, and it seems impossible to represent the impossible. And the world does not seem to represent anything like chance. Look, uh, you're counting the cards, you're playing blackjack, you're counting the cards, you think there's a 40% chance that the next card is going to be less than 10. But there, you know, and that's in your mind, but really there is just one card. I mean, you can't prove that there, there doesn't look like there's really any probability like that in reality at all. Hume and empiricists in general tend to be kind of indifferent to that problem. Isn't uh, the problem of sort of fatalism? It, it doesn't really move them. Uh, and, you know, uh, so, okay.
So how does it work? How do we do possible worlds uh, modal logic? Second bullet, consider the computer. A mere automatic symbol processor, that's what the computer is, it just has a program, it gets one symbol, and it has uh, some operations about how it's supposed to you know, transform into another symbol. A mere automatic symbol processor, it needs an ontology, which is what they use in computer science. Um, it has to have at least an X and a Y, these objects over which it is computing. <clears throat> But, you know, in the first place, these things, these X's and Y's that you're populating your computer's world with can't have modal properties. Computer doesn't know about that. And it really wasn't until late in, in symbolic logic and therefore late in you know, making computing possible. Uh, you want to look at uh, late 19th century people, but also Alan Turing, interestingly, on this. So last bullet point. How does, uh, what is possible world's modal logic? You say that something's, to say that something's necessary, is to say that it's true in all possible worlds. To say that something is contingent is to say that it's false in some possible world. To say that something is possible is to say that it's true in some possible world. To say that something is impossible is to say that it's uh, false in, in all possible worlds. And probability is about relative sizes of things, the set of possible worlds where Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election, I think is quite a bit larger than the set of possible worlds where Donald Trump did, for example. Um, so modal realism then, well, what on earth uh, it, could modal realism be? It's the position that all possible worlds exist. And I mean, reasonably enough, I mean, if you're sort of at like a cocktail party or something, and you start to tell people about this view that people have, that some people might have, that, that they think it's important to assert that all possible worlds exist and not just this possible world. I mean, WTF, I mean, why would someone say such a thing? And again, the reason is basically uh, to defend a certain sort of metaphysical attitude. David Lewis defends this metaphysical thesis of modal realism, the view that all possible worlds are equally real. Opposed to the view is actualism. Actualism, the view that only the actual world exists. What kind of things does David Lewis say in response to this claim that only the actual world exists? Well, first of all, he says that actual is just an indexical, like me or there. It's a word that whether if you say me, it means one thing. If I say me, it means another. And he says, look, uh, it looks like actual is just like that. I mean, this is a possible world, after all. For certain, this is a possible world. This world exists, so it's a possible world. And besides, second bullet point, Lewis says, look, um, the modal logic, I mean, we do do modal logic with possible worlds uh, symbols. So, I mean, that's a commitment. I mean, that is uh, we, that's how the semantics of our logic works. We are saying that. So... Um, as to material monism, third bullet point, whatever else we might think about modal realism, see, well, what's a crazy thing to, to hold modal realism that all possible worlds exist? But why would, but what do you get from it? Well, what you get is there aren't any non physical things still. You've explained modality just in terms of sets of physical worlds, and each one of those possible worlds is just a physical world full of physical objects. So you're not you're still not saying there are any non-physical objects because you're saying that the possible worlds are just like this world. They're all the same, just like this. One. See, that's the key to why you would say such a thing. Uh, last bullet point. It's ironic that the metaphysically conservative project of monist materialism. Let me unpack that. Metaphysically conservative. Don't want to say there are any non-physical uh, platonic objects. Don't want to have any um, anything that's not material of monist materialism leads to these views, such as that the past and future are equally real. That's another problem in the metaphysics of time. It just all ties together. Uh, uh, people and modal realism. So, so looking at this, you know, sometimes when you look at um, contemporary metaphysics and you just hear some things that seem a little bit strange, you want to keep your eye on the ball. What is novel? This is an ancient view. Uh, there's also a medieval um, part of, of nominalism. But, uh, but the basic idea is to preserve a kind of physicalist ontology. Again, the irony of nominalism is it goes to such very far uh, lengths to do that.
uh, as modal realism. All right, so um, so I hope that uh, I hope that wasn't uh, too quick. Doing this under slightly odd conditions, but I just really wanted to get this one out. So um, yeah, uh, nominalism explained, and again, I hope that's helpful. And uh, I shall see how this turns out. Right now. Okay, thank you very much. Bye -bye.